Welcome to Entrepreneur Mindset Reset, the podcast for entrepreneurs who want to learn from fellow business owners how to decrease the chaos and increase their sense of fulfillment while becoming more profitable. I'm your host, Tracy Trepesky. I'm an executive coach and consultant and mindset mastery expert. I'm also mom to two amazing teenagers and a menagerie of adopted furry family members. In each episode, we explore challenges, opportunities, and actionable tips to help you move your business forward while staying true to your vision. You'll hear from me and my guests how we've tackled some of the pitfalls and unexpected surprises that entrepreneurship delivers. We're the real deal, and we're here to inspire and encourage you. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today for a new episode of Entrepreneur Mindset Reset. I am thrilled that you're joining us today to learn about vulnerability and consistency as a way to create engaging content. I feel so fortunate to have had this conversation with Andrew Ryder, who helps coaches and course creators reimagine content creation in an authentic and engaging way. Andrew shares his best tips on how to tell better morals in storytelling. So if you've thought about engaging your audience with stories, or you think you're supposed to, but you feel strange about it, give this episode a listen. Andrew's warmth and honest desire to help his clients build their businesses through engagement is palpable. You will not want to miss his story about Superman not being relatable until he had an actual weakness. That story is fascinating. I think you're going to love it. He also talks about the movie, The Greatest Showman, and relates it back to the entrepreneurial journey. You'll probably quickly pick up that Andrew is a natural storyteller, and I was captivated from the get-go. He completely stopped me in my tracks when he said that if you're thinking of hiring a copywriter, it's almost as bad as writing your own copy if you don't know what you're doing. Andrew shares so much knowledge, so you'll want to listen closely and take notes. Don't miss his best advice. Be consistent and be clear about who you are and what you want, and then go do that every day. I so enjoyed our conversation, and I'm certain you will too. So grab a beverage or a snack and settle in to listen to Andrew and his amazing journey. Andrew, thank you so much for coming today. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Hey, Tracy. Yeah, I'm excited to be here too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, while we were in the in the green room warming up, lots of things came up. So I don't even know where to start. But I'll just start where we always start. But our conversation, I'm sure, is going to be really rich for our listeners to learn about your journey and about content creation, since we were just talking about how important that is. <laughs> but before we dive in, tell us, where are you located? I'm located in Seattle, Washington, and it's a uh, dark and gloomy morning out this morning, as is pretty typical for this time of year. So like nine months of the year. I grew up in Seattle, yeah. so I'm very, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> You're very yeah. familiar. I am yeah. very familiar. I remember that 47 and cloudy. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's <laughs> uh, not far off from yeah. how it is right now. So. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> now you were talking about vitamin D consumption and how important that yeah. is this time of yep, year, absolutely. nine months out of the year. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I have a big heart for Seattle. I'm very far from home, but I just it has a special place in my heart. The Pacific Northwest is incredibly beautiful. So yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, you know, a lot of people say that the three months of sunshine that you do get makes the whole rest of the year worth it to, oh, yeah. to be out here. So. Yeah, I agree. It's so pretty. Yeah. It has to have some way of getting that lush, right? So the, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the moisture exactly. in the gray is for those evergreens. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm just thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to share your story with our listeners. So I would love to start maybe with just tell us what you do and how you came to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I like to say that I'm helping online educators to reimagine the way that they approach content creation. Social media has really, it's fundamentally changed the way that we as humans interact with each other, but it hasn't changed the way that humans need to connect and the needs of those interactions and those interpersonal communications. And and there's really a big opportunity that a lot of educators and content creators are are missing out on to really make a connection with their audience through the content that they create and and through the work that they're doing and to really build a relationship with their audience you know that that is really key for me and the work that I do is in building a relationship as opposed to just focusing on you know so many marketers get really focused in on getting more transactions and making more sales 
at the expense of building a, a real relationship with the person who's on the other side of that transaction. Mm. And, you know, really, I got started as an entrepreneur in sort of a typical way that a lot of people get started. I read some books. I perused the options on Facebook. I watched a lot of ads. I downloaded a lot of lead magnets and I listened to just podcast after podcast after podcast on how to start a business, how to make money online. And I really got started in that sort of biz op type of, of niche where the focus was on, as I said, you know, it's on making sales. It's not really about helping people. It's not really about building relationships with people. It's not about being a part of a community and serving that community. It's really just you know, how can I make money in a really simple way or an easy way so then I can go retire and move to Hawaii or something and just go surfing while people are just buying my program on autopilot and I don't have to actually do any work, right? Mm. And that was a big mindset shift for me was in transitioning from just trying to make money to actually trying to make an impact. You know, so many, so many entrepreneurs, especially in the beginning, start a business in order to be impacted. You know, they mm -hmm. want, they want the business to impact their life. They want the business to provide them for freedom and to provide them with money. But it's really in making that shift to how can I have an impact? How can I leave my people better than when they found me? How can I help these other people to transform their lives? By impacting other people, that's how you really get the biggest impact on your own life. Mm -hmm. I think you you make a really interesting point there too that I think is important for everyone to slow down and hear, which is you know you may start the business thinking I'm you know I can create unlimited potential for my income, freedom for myself. These are all really important things to take into account, of course, but. I think every guest I've had on this podcast has said in one way or another, if money is your focus, you're doing the wrong thing, right? It's more about being of service. How can I support people? How can I make their lives better or their businesses or whatever it is, you know, that you might be selling and selling is definitely part of it because we're not really a business if we don't have revenues. So of course we have to think about that, mm -hmm. but I love that distinction, right? That you may have originally started thinking one way and then there's that shift to, okay, this is what we're really doing here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of these, a lot of these lessons that I learned along the way came from making just massive failures and learning and growing out of those failures into, you know, it, it took me three or four years of just really, really trying to make money as hard as I could. And that just made me so miserable you know, I, I had a decent, you know, not to like brag or anything, but I, I had a good life before I encountered entrepreneurship. I didn't even know what it was until I read rich dad, poor dad. And the more I got into sort of the online business type of entrepreneurship and mindset, the more miserable I became. And the more time I spent on social media, the more I was just not good enough the more I was just so flawed and so behind. And no matter how hard I work, you know, I like to joke that you could work 30 hours a day, eight days a week, and you still wouldn't be working hard enough to keep up with the people online. And, and so entrepreneurship made me terribly miserable for a very long time until I decided to consciously make some of these changes where you know, I decided to build the business around the way that I wanted to interact with people and the, the the things that even if I wasn't making any money doing it, it would be worth doing. It would be valuable to people. It would be valuable to me. You know, a lot of the stuff that I do and, and I'm a big writer, all of that, that writing, even if nobody reads it, it's extremely valuable to me in that it's it helps me think out loud. It helps me refine my ideas. It helps me remember things. And so even if nobody ever reads any of my writing and it's just me alone in my room, just typing to myself and entertaining myself with puns and witty banter that I come up with along the way, it's valuable to me and to my own journey. Have you noticed that you get more interaction with the things that you write when you're in that space writing it? 
meaning like really kind of dropping into your heart and being who you are. I think the word authenticity is sort of overused, but to, to use something that people are familiar with, when you're authentically being you, you're cracking yourself up, you're quite pleased with your, your puns <laughs> and witty yeah. banter, right? I notice when I just write from the heart or speak from the heart that those are the kinds of posts that get the most interaction. So I wonder if you see any connection to that. Yeah, I think that you feel like you need to be a certain way or you need to act a certain way to, you know, this is this is how you grow your audience. And, and you have to be this type of charismatic influencer type of person who only publishes their highlight reel online. And so I think authenticity is definitely a huge part of it, but I I wouldn't necessarily use that word. And and I guess to directly answer your question, yes, the the most authentic things and the most the word that I like to use is vulnerability. Mm. So the most vulnerable things are are what really resonate with people. And the story that I like to tell about this is related to Superman. Right? So Superman is this um, you know, incredible superhero who shoots laser beams from his eyes and he can fly and he has all of these powers and he's basically indestructible, right? The only thing that can stop Superman is kryptonite. But when the Superman comics were originally invented, there was no kryptonite. Superman had all of the powers that he had and he had no weaknesses. And the audience for Superman couldn't relate to him because every single story was exactly the same. There was no question about whether or not he was going to win, whether or not he was going to defeat his enemies. You know, you think a lot about the hero's journey, right? There was nothing that was going to prevent him from achieving that end goal because he was perfect. He was indestructible. He could never fail. Mm. And so the, the comics started to lose interest. They lost traction. And so the, the writers and the creators of Superman actually invented kryptonite to save Superman, not mm. to kill him, right? And they saved him by making him vulnerable because the introduction of kryptonite gives him a weakness. It gives him a reason for people to show up and to watch and to see what happens. You, you know, there is a possibility, a real possibility that he gets defeated because of kryptonite. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that the same is true for business owners, for creators, for entrepreneurs who are putting themselves out there. You know, there's sort of this fear that if you put your real, authentic, vulnerable self out there, that people are going to reject you, right? Or they're not going to like you or they're, the trolls are going to come after you. And like we were saying, you know, I've found that being vulnerable rather than trying to put on this facade of perfection or putting my best self out there. That's really what builds a relationship with people because people know that you know, everyone knows that nobody's perfect. If you present yourself as perfect, people will, they won't trust you as much because they'll expect that you're hiding something. It just doesn't really, you know, at a, at a sort of biological level, we're distrusting of people who seem perfect because we all know that no one's perfect. Mm -hmm. So by getting that vulnerability out there and bonding with your audience over common failures or common setbacks, it gives you more credibility, but it also allows you the opportunity to say, Hey, I used to struggle with all of these problems that you're probably struggling with. And then, you know, I created this methodology or I created this course, or, you know, this is the exact problem that I help people overcome in my coaching practice because you know I had these problems and I solved them in this way. So it gives you a really good opportunity to relate to your audience and then to segue right into the work that you do. Mm, that's lovely. So do you do you use the book or kind of rely on the book or touch back to the book, the story brand? It sounds like you do some of that kind of work, right? That you're telling stories. Yeah. I love the word vulnerable. I think authentic is so overpiped that people don't even know what it means anymore. So I think there's a fine line depending on what people do for a living, right? Like there's a fine line of how vulnerable, how much people want to know about certain kinds of service providers. <laughs> there's a, yeah. you know, there is like the internet overshare, but I think it's interesting that you're using story. That sounds like you're using story to connect with people and that that makes 
that connection. Am I, am I picking up the right thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of building a story brand. One thing that I like to clarify about storytelling, because as with everything, you know, we're talking about authenticity, a lot of people like to take a popular buzzword and just take it to the, the extreme. And so it loses all of its, its value, right? Like we say authenticity, but do we even really know what authenticity means anymore? You know, it's, it's just so overplayed. The same can be true with storytelling. There's a group of sort of storytelling experts that have just taken it way to the extreme. And, and they've basically said that just tell stories, just have interesting life experiences, go out and do all these fun things and tell your audience about all these fun things that you're doing. And they will envy you or they'll want to, you know, that'll be the highest converting content that you can create. And I think the same thing has happened there where it's been taken a little bit too far to the extreme. So I don't necessarily try to tell the most amazing, compelling story. You know, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's hard to get these super awesome lifestyle moments because most of us just spend all day working and building our businesses because that's what we enjoy doing. Right. Is like, you know, I sit at my computer and I write and I love doing that, Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) but it doesn't make for the most compelling um, story about my life. You know, yeah, it's not like sexy and shiny. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But it's real. (laughs) It is. And and so what I try to focus on is to tell better morals, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and you might think of it might come to mind like the idea of a Disney movie where at the end they say the moral of the story is, and then they just hand it to you, right? Here's what you can learn from this story. That's going to be applied to your life in some way. So yeah, I tell a lot of stories and, you know, like take this Superman story we were talking about. It's not so much about Superman being vulnerable or invulnerable, right? But it's about how you can apply that to your life to improve your own life, right? So it's not just about, you know, oh, I, I had this amazing experience where I went and I, I used this very specific content creation framework that allowed me to 10x my income this month, right? If you want to get it, go to my website, right? That's, that's a story, about something that I did and that relates directly to the programs and the products that I sell, right? But the other option would be to tell a story that doesn't relate directly. Mm. It could be a story about Superman. It could be a story about taking your dog for a walk this weekend. The real power is in translating that story through a moral into something that relates to what your audience does, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you look at the most powerful stories in movies and in TV shows and in books, this is what they're doing. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Greatest Showman for a couple of reasons. It's, you know, it's this, it's Hugh Jackman is, uh, it, it's the story of P.T. Barnum and his creation of basically the, the circus. And so it's, it's an entrepreneurial tale. But it's also, it's just really cool to watch. Um, It's a musical and it's really cool to watch these singers and actors just, there's something cool and exciting about watching people who are just the best at what they do performing at a really high level. Mm -hmm. And so it's really inspiring to watch that from the performance aspect, but also I just love the entrepreneurial story in that movie. And one of the things that you notice, um, I watched it recently for I think the third or fourth time. And I never noticed this before, but at the beginning of the movie, you know, they, they sing a song and and he's basically saying the the line is this, everything you ever want, everything you ever need is here right in front of you. And he's singing this line as he is building the circus. And he's has all of these sort of, um, interesting and unique people who are participating in the circus. And that's the allure and the draw is seeing these fantastical things that you can't see anywhere else. And and the product that he's selling is joy, right? People come and they just have this magical experience. And he goes through this whole hero's journey and he builds this wildly successful business. He loses everything. He loses all of his money. He almost loses his relationship. And he gets to the end. And at the end of the film, the very last line is, is that exact line. It's everything you've ever 
wanted. Everything you ever need is here right in front of you. And he's sitting in this auditorium. He's watching his daughters in the ballet and he's sitting there like with his wife right next to him. And that, that moment to me is really powerful because I think a lot of us were chasing, chasing more and more and more success in our businesses, but we often fail to realize that those relationships with your family or your kids, or, you know, there's, there's other things, maybe it's your health. There's other things that are more important than building a, a bigger business or, you know, getting that extra hour in of, of work. It is so easy to let work consume you that you neglect other aspects of your life. And, you know, that was a really powerful moment for me in, in watching that movie again. And I realized that that is the same exact moral and the same exact story as the alchemist, which is a really popular, you know, one of the most popular books of all time Mm -hmm. because of that moral, right? It's the idea that this boy goes on this journey and and he neglects relationships and he's seeking just this success or this sort of mystical thing that's just beyond his grasp. But at the end of the story, he realizes that it was within him all along. And, And that, that moral just resonates so strongly with everyone, no matter what it is that you're trying to accomplish, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's some completely unrelated thing, everyone resonates with that. And I think that's a huge part of, you know, the success of the alchemist, right? But it's also a huge part of the success of the greatest showman. And it's in in applying that lesson of everything that you wanted, it's right in front of you. If you just make that mindset shift and really appreciate what you have, the moments you have, the relationships you have, you know, that's really what, what it's all about. Mm. I love that. And it sounds like that's a driving value for you, right? One of your, your, probably your top values is I'm guessing, right. Based on just how, how you're able to share that. Do you, when you work with your clients, do you take them on a journey where they share things like this, like what's most important to them? And, or like, how do you support your clients in writing compelling copy and content? Yeah, that's so the journey I think is it is something that I that I try to help them get clear on but it's not necessarily directly in terms of how you're going to write better content or write better sales copy. I think that on social media especially it's too easy to lose your values because you're constantly getting bombarded with other people's values. Mm-hmm. You're constantly getting told that you should value this material thing or whatever it is, someone's trying to sell you something, whether it's an ideology or a physical product or a belief system or or, or whatever it is, you're constantly getting your values overridden by someone else's values. And that I think is a recipe for disaster in any aspect of life. You start doing things that then take you off course. And really, you know, that's how I ended up becoming so miserable with trying to pursue all these sort of entrepreneurial biz op type things. It wasn't in line with what I value. Mm -hmm. So not only does that help you mentally, but it helps you focus and it helps you simplify your processes and your systems in your business. So that's definitely something we talk about. And I think getting clear on what you value, you know, we go back to talking about authenticity and vulnerability. This is knowing what you truly value and willing to be vulnerable about it and to say, look, I I know that a lot of people value these things. A lot of people value building a big business and and having all of this material or financial success and getting more followers on Instagram or, or whatever it might be. But, you know, I've found more fulfillment in my life or more success in my business by valuing these things, right? And and here's why. Here's a story to elaborate on that. Mm. That is how that sort of connects back to the content creation side of things. I love it. And who's in your niche? Who are the people that you serve? Predominantly online educators. Mm -hmm. So um, generally people who are in an earlier earlier stages in their business, you know, a lot of the experiences that I had in online business and and in trying to sort of collect all of these tactics and learn all of these different ways to gimmick people into buying from you. I spent a lot of time there. And, you know, I just like to say that if 
I can share my story, if I can, if I can share the lessons that I've learned that will prevent people from dropping another $10,000 on a coaching program that is all hype and all lies. And it's, there's no substance behind it. You know, if I can save one person, $10,000, I consider that a win. You know, if I can save someone from investing a year of their life into trying to collect all of these different things and learn all these tactics, and instead I can convince them to invest in strategy and it, to be consistent, you know, pick something that they enjoy doing, pick something that they want to do or that they they think is valuable and stick with that one thing and to be consistent with it. Like for a, a big thing that I work with my clients on is daily consistent content creation. That has been the most powerful thing from a sort of tactical standpoint in my business. Those types of things, you know, if I can, if I can save one or two or 10 people from making those massive mistakes that really held me back for a long time, whether it's, you know, a strategic mistake or a mindset mistake, it's all worth it to me. This is really juicy for our listeners, I think, to really, to really pay attention to this. And one thing that I teach my clients as well is that tactics without strategy are going nowhere. It's like getting in your car and driving without a destination. Like it's cute, but it's not going to really get you where you need to be or where you want to be. And this, I think, is really challenging for entrepreneurs because we're always in a hurry. <laughs> We like to be in control and everything is shiny and sparkly and squirrel-like. And so therefore very interesting and urgent. And so I think this is a really big challenge for people who serve entrepreneurs is to, you know, use the slow down to speed up methodology, <laughs> right? But this, this piece right here, right? Like you're saying, it's, you've got to be clear on your strategy got to be willing to commit to it and stick to it and then consistently apply it. And do you, I'm sure this comes up for people. It comes up for me in my own work. Like when we're doing something new or different, we commit to a certain amount of time of marketing in a particular way to gather data, to see what is and isn't working and to give consumers time to adjust to this new thing that we're doing. Do you advise people to like commit to doing things a certain way for a certain period of time before they say, oh, you know, this isn't working or, cause this is again, kind of what entrepreneurs do. We can, we can be very absolute and be like, well, that doesn't work. Nobody wants it when maybe we just need to tweak something and how we're presenting it or. Yeah. So I, I do have, I want to, before we lo lose something that you said, I want to say, I want to tell a quick story, short answer. Yes. And I do have a lot of thoughts on feedback loops and on testing and measuring. But you know, you, to illustrate the difference between strategy and tactics, because I think this is a really important point, there's an example that I haven't been able to find this anywhere other than um, a, another marketer, Ben Settle, likes to tell this story. And it's, it's a story about Gary Halbert, who is widely considered to be the world's greatest copywriter um, of all time. Gary Halbert writes a, you know, he was sort of in the direct marketing, direct mail days. He wrote a promotion for a particular product and he mailed it and he made, he made five figures. Maybe it was 40 or 50 grand from that promotion. And, you know, that's pretty good for maybe a day's work, maybe a week's work, especially, you know, 40 years ago um, when he did it. That's the tactical approach is like, I'm going to just write a letter and I'm going to mail it. And I'm going to use all of the direct mail marketing tactics that Gary Halbert, you know, is a master at, and he was definitely a very strong tactician, right? The other marketer who is a vastly inferior copywriter, he was a, you know, maybe an average copywriter, Chase Revel. He wrote a promotion for the same product. He then captured the customer's information and he continued to market more products, coaching, services, membership, you know, newsletter, a whole bunch of, you know, he made a business out of it. And from a strategic point of view, he said, how can I take these initial customers from this promotion? How can I improve their lives more? How can I sell them something else? Looking at the big picture. And he made $25 million in backend sales. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, and, and it's not to take away from what Gary Halbert did. The point is to illustrate you don't have to be the best copywriter in the world to run a successful business from a strategic point of view. And 
you know, most of us, you know, that's great news because yeah. most of us, probably all of us are not the greatest copywriter in the world. And, and so <laughs> most of us also can't afford to pay the best copywriter in that the world. That is exactly right. We're not yeah. running, you know, $30 million businesses or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, and a lot of times paying a copywriter is going to get you a worse, worse sales copy than doing it yourself because mm. not only do you have to pay them to write the copy. You have to pay them to understand your business. You have to pay them to be interested and to convey all of that emotion and all of the passion that you bring to your products and to what you do. I've hired copywriters before and I've just found it to be just always significantly worse than doing it yourself. Because 99% of the time you're going to pay them, they're going to do the work, you're going to read it, and you're just going to throw it away and do, redo it yourself anyways. But I do want to talk. So you, you had asked about how long do you test a particular system or a particular change or anything that you're implementing? How do you know if it's working? How do you know if it's not working? How do you know that you've collected enough data to make that decision? Right. That's the question. So my approach to this is a concept called validated learning, which is a concept from Eric Reese's book called The Lean Startup. And, and this book is predominantly for sort of the startup um, Silicon Valley type of online or offline business where you are, um, you know, you're, you're measuring, you're iterating, you're getting feedback, you know, you're doing sort of the minimum viable product approach and you're trying to get something out and test it and improve it, right? It's So it's not, not everything that he shares in the book is directly applicable to a lot of online businesses, there's just a lot of different considerations. If you're hundred percent online versus you are a Uber or, you know, a company that's got a hundred million dollars in funding to develop a sort of physical product that is accompanied by, because a lot of these, you know, you, you might think of Uber as a car service company, but it's really a technology company, right? It's yeah. really the software behind it that, that makes it work. So, you know, a lot of these companies, there is a physical component, there is an investment in infrastructure, but there's also, you know, a, a huge software component. So if you're only in the online space, if you're developing software or selling informational products, the considerations are slightly different. But this idea of validated learning does apply. And it's the idea that you want to make the most, the smallest incremental change in your product, in your program you want to start from basically the smallest point. You want to avoid basically what would be spending 12, 12 months of your life or, or five years of your life or your entire career developing something that no one cares about, right? You might care about it and you might build all of these things, but if nobody else is interested in it or if you have take the wrong approach to it and it doesn't resonate with your market or your audience, you've essentially wasted all of that time. So the idea of a minimum viable product is basically what's the minimum thing that you can develop that then you can post out to your audience or to the marketplace and get feedback on that, right? Mm -hmm. So a popular model for info marketers would be to make a tweet or make a social media post, a couple hundred words, a couple hundred characters. Here's my idea, you know, and you do that with, let's say you have 10 ideas. You do that with your ideas. And you notice that one or two of them get a lot of traction. One or two of them really don't get any traction at all. And then there's, you know, sort of the majority in the middle that do, I guess, what you would call average. You want to sort of change or eliminate the ideas that don't get traction, right? Why are those ideas not working? What, what's wrong with those ideas? Can I rephrase them? Do they just not work at all? And you want to take, you want to start collecting all of those ideas that do really well and turn those small ideas into larger blog posts, into eventually courses, or it, it, you keep enhancing them and expanding on them and seeing what's working, seeing what's resonating and eliminating or modifying what isn't. But there's something to be cautious of when it comes to getting feedback. And that's, are, is the feedback that you're getting coming from your ideal client or not? And that's really important, especially if you're just posting out on, on Twitter or you're posting on Instagram or on YouTube and anyone in the world can view and comment on your ideas. Mm -hmm. 
I am more inclined to get feedback or to tell my clients to aim to get feedback from, and you know, a lot of businesses aren't set up in this way. So there's sort of some work that needs to be done before you can do this, but you know, to have a membership site or a coaching program or some sort of recurring revenue in your business is really important. That's where you're going to get that monthly consistent income. And especially for coaches, because you see this all the time where you have these massive months where you bring on five new clients and you're just scrambling around. You're so busy and it's hard to fit all of the calls in and all the the prep work and all of these things. And then the next month you don't get any new clients. And so there's these wild fluctuations and there's sort of the feast famine mentality in, in coaching for a lot of people. Creating a group coaching program or a newsletter or some sort of continuity program is going to give you a consistent baseline income to where you know, you're going to be confident that you can, you can pay this month's bills, right? So monthly recurring revenue is really important in that aspect. You know, software is a really great way. It's the, probably the best way to get a monthly recurring revenue. It's going to have the highest retention rate over an sort of informational based recurring product. But in talking about feedback, when you are soliciting feedback from a social media audience or your email list or a, a free audience, you don't have complete control. You don't know that the person giving you feedback, you don't know if they're an ideal client. You don't know if they're actually serious about what you do. You don't know the quality of the information you're getting. Mm-hmm. But if you go to say your membership site or or the people who are already paying you one, so they're paying you, right? They have agreed and they have said your content, your information, your services are valuable. They've said that they've raised their hand. I want your help to solve this problem. I have this problem. I believe in your solution. All of that means that for the most part, they're going to be an ideal client or pretty close to it. And, you know, yes, there's going to be people that get into your programs that aren't ideal clients. And eventually they work themselves out. They leave, you give them an opportunity to leave because they're just going to bring the whole group down, to be honest. So there's, there's opportunities to select those people out of your audience and really just continue to refine it, continue to get that really high quality group of what you would call an ideal client. So that when you when you're sharing ideas with them, you can test your ideas on a, a smaller group of people who you know is really high quality. And you'll find that the, the quality of feedback you get from that group of people is significantly more valuable. And it's it's just pinpoint accurate to the type of people that you want to attract to your mm-hmm. business. And it will be repulsive to the people who you want to repel from your business. Yeah. I think that's a really important point for people to to listen carefully to as well, right? I mean, you've shared a lot of wisdom today. But this is one where I think where the danger of social media can really come in and mess with our heads and also mess with our data. I don't think that it's important how many likes one gets. I think the quality of interaction is one thing, but even then, if you're using that, you know, if you're just doing a general poll, that's one thing. But if you really want to get that feedback, I love that you're reminding people to go to their already captive audience, people who already see the value in the work or service that's provided. I recently was making some changes and had brief phone calls, like 15 minute calls with existing and prior clients and asked them some very specific questions and made connections I hadn't made before. When I had those conversations, there was a recurring theme. There was at least one thing, 100% that people came to me for. And then there were a few variations on the others, but the one thing, Mm -hmm. and it happened to be the thing that I was intuitively wanting to create programming around. So I was really glad to get that, that validation. I would have been kind of bummed to table it. I don't think I would have scrapped it, but I might've tabled it. There's that point of like going to your people. And another thing that you said is like, when you find the things that you don't have to ditch all of your other ideas, maybe some of the things that you provide as either a service or a product to your clients could be valuable, but they might not recognize that they need it right now. So when I think about my clients, you know, my personal coach who trained me (laughs) asked me once, how long until you have your clients, you know, meditating, journaling, taking time to themselves, doing that kind of practice. 
I was like, oh, you know, like three appointments. <laughs> she thought that was really funny that we go deep that fast. But if I put on my marketing, I'll have you meditating in two, you know, sessions. That doesn't, it doesn't even resonate, right? Mm. It, it doesn't even resonate, but it is one of the things by far, and it's very different for each client, but that they need to carve out quiet time, contemplative white space mm. time. If I advertise that in the beginning, it doesn't resonate at all. Right. So it's still important. It's something that comes up after we deep dive. So I just want to point that out that you don't always have to scrap the ideas that don't get the traction. If you're doing deep work with clients, it might just be something that's a little further in their journey and you can still have really great content and work for people. Definitely. It's, um, you know, there's a distinction between, and I've heard this in a couple of successful sort of beginner online course or online coaching products is, you know, they sell you the idea of make this much money or, um, you know, create this type of business or this type of product. But what they spend the majority of the time in the course teaching you is the mindset. Mm -hmm. It's to slow down. It's to get really clear on what you want. You know, people don't want to buy mindset, but you have to have it in order to be successful in, in anything. And, you know, that's one of the things that I teach as well is to get people to take a step back, to take some quiet time for themselves, whether it's thinking time or it's meditation, you know, it's, we get caught up in this mindset of being so busy and always having to be productive. And you find that when you have the best time to meditate is when you don't have time to meditate, right? <laughs> <laughs> the best time to take a step back is when you're so busy and so stressed and so overwhelmed that you just can't fit it into your schedule. That's when it's going to be most impactful for you. And I also want to expand on one thing that you, that you said related to what I would call the difference between, you know, we've been talking about soliciting market feedback, but there's a danger there. And, you know, a lot of successful visionaries and business owners are leaders. And by that, I mean, they don't just ask their market what products and services they want, right? There's this quote from Henry Ford, where he says that, if I'd asked people what, what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? right. He didn't, yeah. he didn't want to give them faster horses. He wanted to give them automobiles. Mm -hmm. There's examples of, you know, Steve jobs did this. People didn't want iPhones. He said, I don't really care what you think you want. I'm going to create the greatest product that has ever existed. The greatest user experience. That's not just a cell phone, but it is a completely new way to live your life and a product that allows you to express yourself in a completely new way. And it's going to be so cool that you're going to love it. And you, you, you like you as the customer are not the visionary. I'm the visionary. I'm going to make something so cool that you have to have it. And he did exactly that. So there's sort of a push pull, uh, you know, back and forth between validating your ideas and making sure that it's it's going to be useful to the people who you're serving but also at some point you need to step up as the business owner as the visionary as the leader and you need to take them where they need to go you know a, a lot of people will they'll tell you what they think they want or they'll tell you what they think you want to hear and those are not necessarily what they need and a lot of times people don't want to hear what they need they want you to create it to cast a vision for them and then convince them of all the reasons why they absolutely need it. And, and when you see, you know, really high end visionaries like Steve jobs, they're doing it in this way. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I think, you know, also remembering there are four primary reasons that people buy, make money, save money, save time and avoid effort. So if we can hit one or all of those in what we're offering, even if it's something they don't think they want or need, they find reasons to want or need it. Have you ever gone to Target and everything's six ninety nine, and then you leave and you've spent like four hundred dollars? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, not exactly. saying I've ever done that, but I'm just saying that I've heard that that can happen. Yeah. A friend <laughs> right? of mine, yeah, right. A friend of mine once said <laughs> something about the one spot, right? But I mean, I think it's true. Like we don't know what we want or need sometimes. 
until it's presented to us. So I love that. And to keep that in mind, if you've got, you know, for our listeners, if you've got a big idea and a lot of people are telling you it's impossible, that might be the reason to do it, to really bring it forward. Yeah. I don't know about you, but, and this may just be a personality thing for me, but um, this is less true of online interactions, but in real interpersonal interactions, if someone tells me I cannot do something, I immediately become 100% dedicated to doing it just to prove them wrong. Yes. And, you know, I'll use the example of the, the example that comes to mind. This was, this was probably five, six years ago. I was moving in with some buddies, uh, some college friends of mine. We, we had all moved back to Seattle after college and um, we decided to get a house together. It was five of us. And uh, there wasn't, you know, for one reason or another, the room that I ended up with didn't have a closet. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make one of those things that you see on Etsy where it's like this um, iron pipe kind of design where you can make your own coat hanger. And so I, I, I looked it up and I did the research and I told some of my friends that I was going to make it. And, and they said, uh, no, you're definitely not going to do that. And I was like, I thought, I thought we were friends. I thought you, you had faith in me and that, you know, that fired me up. I went out the next weekend, went up to my parents' house, got out the, the saw, you know, cut everything to length, assembled it, brought it home and proved them wrong. You know, so it, uh, you know, part of it was about how can I build something that's functional as a closet, um, you know, to, to hang my clothes on, but a significant portion of it was, I have to prove you wrong now that you've challenged me. Right. So I, I don't know, maybe that's a me thing, but no, I, I know I, some other people are like that too. <laughs> I think it's a bit of an entrepreneurial trait. There's a, a bit of contrarian in every mm-hmm. entrepreneur, right? There's, and also just wanting to function outside of the norm or the box, right? It's like, there's a fire. This isn't to say that other people don't have a fire, but the entrepreneurial fire is different. No, it's Mm -hmm. very, yeah. If somebody tells me I can't off, I go watch me and maybe they know, maybe they know, maybe that's why they tell me I can't. Yeah, that's right. People who know you really well (laughs) will do it intentionally because they'll, they'll know that, uh, they'll know that that's the motivation that you need to actually see it through. (laughs) So. Yeah. Let's not overthink that. Cause then we'll start playing mind games and, you know, yeah, talk right, ourselves exactly. out of stuff. Well, yeah. maybe they're tricking me or something. Yeah. Just go with that. Mm-hmm. Keep that contrarian nature. <laughs> Definitely. Oh my gosh. Oh, well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I feel like there's a lot of value and I, I am going to go back and re-listen. I always do once production is finished, but I think there's a lot that I want to listen as a consumer and write down my own notes and kind of take that back to my company and share with my team. So if I feel that way, I'm definitely certain that our listeners are going to be getting a lot of value. So before we take off, I would love to ask you how we can support you. Where can we find you and how can we support you? Yeah, well, I'm so glad that you got some actionable advice and and some, you know, insights that you can take back to your business. If folks who are listening want to get in touch with me, want to Reimagine that the, the way that they create content for their business so they can create better relationships with their audience instead of just trying to go from transaction to transaction. The best way to connect with me is at andrewbrider.com. That's my website. You can opt in for my email newsletter and I give away some free stuff as well that will help you to start creating better content today. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes and so I think I have some other links for you too. So all the links that we have, we'll put in the show notes so you can find and connect with Andrew. Wonderful. Well, do you have any parting advice that you'd like to share with our listeners? My go-to best advice, if this was the only thing that I could share with you is to be consistent. You know, this is sort of a theme in various parts of our conversation today, but get really clear on who you are what you want, and then do it every day. The the most valuable and most impactful things in your life come from exponential gains. And and it's not just in compounding interest in your bank account, right? It's in compounding interest in your relationships with other people, in the content you create in your business. There's so many areas in life where just by doing it every day, it's going to keep getting better and better and better. And that's where all the results come is 
weeks and months and years into the process and not the first day, the first time you try it. Mm. So stay consistent. I love that. It's kind of like investing in an IRA, right? We make our daily Mm -hmm. or however we do it. We make our frequent deposits and then it's like, it looks like, so all these people who we think have had overnight success have been making daily deposits Mm -hmm. for years, months, years, decades, even possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yep, that's the, awesome. the interest earns interest mm-hmm, for sure. Oh my gosh. Well, I just, I really enjoyed our conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing your wisdom and, and your journey. I think there's a lot in there for our listeners. Take notes, rewind. If you think you heard something you need to hear again, <laughs> and write it down. Cause I think that there's a lot of, you've shared a lot of great information. And like we said, like actionable tips, like you can take something today and learn and go forward. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. uh, Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tracy, for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for listening to this episode of Entrepreneur Mindset Reset. If you liked what you heard, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll never miss a show. Please leave us a review and tell your friends about us so more people can hear the valuable information we share in each episode. We look forward to hearing from you and celebrating your success.